Welcome to the Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. I'm your host, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, I interview Jeff Holst, an entrepreneur with a wide-ranging and adventurous spirit. In addition to being a multifamily real estate investor, he is also founder of Nueva, a software development company and founder of the Old Fashioned Real Estate Podcast, which mixes up some great real estate wisdom with the classic cocktail of the same name. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Well, entrepreneurs, uh, this is a show that I have been looking forward to doing for quite some time. We were first scheduled to do this show from the cockpit of my sailboat as we made our way across Lake Erie a month ago. Now back on dry land, you, our listeners, will have the benefit of a much nicer sound experience. I would like to start this show a little differently than usual by observing that real estate and adventure seem to go along with one another. And Jeff, you are clearly an exponent of that. Maybe we could uh, start the interview with a history of Jeff or tell us the story of Jeff. I know you've got a great YouTube video about this, but maybe just a quick uh, 30 seconds. Spiel okay. So. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try. Um, so I'm, listen, I, I've always been interested in travel and um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So the, the super short version is when I was in undergrad, I decided I was going to take a year off and just go around Europe and try to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I kind of centered that around a quest to see this one particular sculpture by Michelangelo called the Moses. And uh, um, I had this idea that when I got there um, and saw it, it would solve all of the mysteries of my life. It turns out that's not how life works. So I walked out of the church that has the sculpture and I looked down at the Colosseum because it's in Rome. And I thought, well, I like seeing old stuff. So I'm just going to go figure out how to make some money. So I went to law school because that was what my dad did. And he made money. So I felt like eh, it's a good way to make money. Did that for about five years. Uh, and I was actually diagnosed with leukemia and ended up going bankrupt. So I was uh, running a small bankruptcy firm. And uh, I had one attorney, I was actually, I climbed uh, Machu Picchu. This is like August of 2008. I was in Machu Picchu, came off of the mountain um, and I checked my voicemail and had a message from the other attorney that worked for me saying he was quitting. Uh, he put in his two week notice. And a week later I was diagnosed with leukemia. So we went from two attorneys to zero in a week's time. Uh, and that forced my firm under and then ultimately us personally. Uh, at that point I thought, well, geez, that didn't work. Um, I got to do something that's going to make money, even if I'm not working. And uh, the only thing I knew that did that was real estate. So I started buying real estate. I took a job and I took all my bonuses and extra money and bought real estate. And that's how I got to where I am now. I love it. And so then uh, you started, I think, with single family and then you moved up to multifamily. So tell us how you made that jump. Yeah, so I um well so the first deal I did was a was a condo. It was 2011, so you know, super cheap bank foreclosure. We bought it for cash, didn't have any credit. Um, took all the money I'd saved in the couple of years since my bankruptcy to buy half of a condo with another guy. And uh, it worked out pretty well. So we just kept doing that and we kept repeating that cycle. You know, we we did a little bit of private money stuff. Um, but we got to about 50 units or so. Um, and I, meanwhile, I was working, I moved to Tennessee. I'm from Michigan originally. I was working down here uh, at a trucking company doing in-house legal um, and hiring and, and compliance and, you know, pretty much anything they needed to do. Financing. I learned a ton about like how to do finance from financing semi-trucks, which is actually not that different than financing houses in a way. Cause you know, they're like $150,000 for a truck. And, you know, so you're negotiating with people and looking at debt coverage ratios and all this stuff. So I learned about all that stuff and I applied that knowledge from that job to like making the transition. And really what happened is they were getting sold to a bigger company, offered me another job in a bigger company. And I already didn't like working in a company the size I was. And I thought, I'll just take the severance. So they gave me six months severance and I figured I would just decide what to do after that. And then I looked at my situation and said, you know, if I start buying multifamily, I might not need to go back to work. So that's why I did it. And I bought a 12 unit about 
six months after I got my severance package and then a 19 unit a, a month after that. And then a 32 unit about uh, three or four months after that. And then we were just off to the races from there. Yeah. And tell me the timeline. This is great recession timeline. Yeah. So I, uh, well, I went bankrupt in 2010. I bought my first deal in 2011. Um, and then uh, in 2017 is when I left my job. So, so 17, the first apartments we bought were October of 17 and um, actually just sold them uh, for a really nice profit uh, like two weeks ago or three, when I was in Puerto Rico, when we were scheduled to interview before that same day is the day that I uh, closed on it remotely. So I love it. Congratulations. That's beautiful to go full cycle. Uh, so then you, you started with, okay, so you started single family, you went to multifamily, you went bigger and bigger. What's the next big step for your enterprise? Yeah, so we've started to look at some commercial stuff. I actually bought a couple of office buildings in the last year or so, um, which I know is counterintuitive because a lot of people are like, oh, office is dead. And I'm like, no, office is on sale. Um, I hope I'm right, <laughs> you know, so we'll see. Um, the ones that we have are doing really well. So I can't argue with that. Um, we bought a couple of strip malls, like neighborhood shopping center kind of places. Um, and those have been those have been pretty solid. And I've actually the 12 unit that I that I sold, um, we're actually 1031 in that into buying a 30,000 square foot uh, office or strip center. So. Awesome. And then uh, maybe just pivot back a little bit to the personal. So I, uh, I've been following your YouTube channel and a lot of fascinating things. So another one of your philosophies is uh, no bad days. Yeah. So that's Tell like, a, yeah. So the thing is, um, that's sort of an offset of what I call the last life ever philosophy, which I have a podcast called that too. I don't know if you've seen that one or not, but, um, so last life ever is just the belief that, you know, we only get this one chance here on earth and we have to live the best possible version of our life. And, um, that started for me with the no bad days thing. When I was 17, um, I woke up one day and I said, this is a terrible day. I'm unhappy. I'd broken up with my girlfriend. Um, I remember I, I was in the, I was in the bathroom looking in the mirror, just being like, oh man, my life's terrible. And then something clicked in my mind. And I said, wait a minute, like I'm young and healthy and I live in America in a rich middle class area. Like how bad can my life really be? And, um, and I said, you know what, today is going to be a good day. Like, it doesn't matter what yesterday was like today will be a good day. And, and then I went out and had another bad day. And so I just am really stubborn. So I just kept saying today's a good day over and over again. And I, this is, this is like pre YouTube. Like I didn't know what positive <laughs> affirmations were, you know, all this stuff. I just went every time I saw a mirror or got in my car or went to bed, like went, walked into a room and there was no one else. I would literally say out loud, today's a good day. And I did that like dozens, maybe hundreds of times a day. Um, and then one day I walked into a 7-Eleven, this is probably like three or four months later, still 17, walk into the 7-Eleven, guy behind the counter says, how are you doing today? And I say, I never have bad days. And I went, holy crap, I never have bad days. And I realized I hadn't had a bad day in a month or so. And uh, I haven't since. Like, I mean, even when I got leukemia, when I went bankrupt, um, you know, people say, well, those are bad things. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, good and bad stuff happens to everyone. It's not like it's a miracle cure for it doesn't inoculate you against bad stuff. But if you take responsibility for how you react to that stuff, um, you can control your outlook and that that matters. And even like when I was um, when I was in in the hospital, uh, I remember like the first day my brother came in and he was like, um, I bet today's a bad day. It was almost like he wanted to prove that it wasn't possible to have a good day when you're finding out you have leukemia. And I was like, well, actually, I didn't get diagnosed till like 10 at night. So most of the day was pretty good. Like, I, you know, I thought it was OK. And um, the next day was a little bit challenging and I was struggling a little. And I kept thinking to myself, I never have bad days. I never have bad days. I never have bad days. And it was struggle. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, there was a shift change about two in the afternoon and this nurse comes in and she looks at me and she's like, oh my God, Jeff, I'm so sorry to see you here. And I was like, oh my God, Shelly, I'm so happy to be here because I recognized her as a babysitter of mine from when I was like 10, the last time I'd seen her. So it had been like 20 years and I was like so excited to see her that it kind of made my day. 
And you might say, well, like on one hand, you have this babysitter that you haven't seen in a while and you haven't seen since, because I, I don't think I've, I've seen her maybe one time since then. And on the other hand, you find out you're dying. And I mean, I, for several months there, I actually did believe I was dying. I mean, we, we thought I had weeks to live when I was diagnosed because it was very bad. Um, my white blood cell count was around 258,000. It's supposed to be like 4,000, right? So it was like, and I don't know much about leukemia, but I did know that my cousin who had died of leukemia a few years earlier, her white blood cell count was 150,000 when she died. So I was kind of like, I'm out, I'm, I'm toast, right? Um, but, uh, but the thing is, my mind defaulted to the positive that I was experiencing and it minimized for that moment, the negative. And I can objectively say that that was the right thing for me at that time, because it made me keep a positive and healthy attitude. And it made me stay optimistic about the future. Uh, even if I thought it was a shorter future than I had planned on, I was like, you know what, I've got this stuff I'm going to do. It's good. My, I have family that loves me. Um, I, I hope I can make it till Christmas because it's like in September, I'm like, I want to see my family again. And, you know, I had all these things that I wanted to do and I was still looking forward to that. And I really feel like that attitude is what got me through that really, really challenging period. And now when I look back at it, I think the day I got diagnosed with leukemia was probably the best day of my life because it showed me that you can go through really tough things and still have good days, but it also pivoted what I did. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have gotten real estate, you know, and I wouldn't have um, last year, I went to Africa for a month. Last month, I literally was in Puerto Rico for a month. Like I could never have done that if I was still practicing law. It just wouldn't be possible. And so all of those things are a direct result of the fact that I got sick. And so, you know, even though it was tough at the time, it, it worked out really well. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love the theme of taking responsibility for your reactions, the difficult situations, maximizing the positive, minimizing the negative. And that to me is very reminiscent of stoicism. Does that play a role in your personal philosophy? Um, you know, it's funny, like I didn't I didn't know it's as much like I didn't know what affirmations were. I didn't know what stoicism is when I started this strategy. <laughs> so I, I'd like to say, oh, yeah, you know, like, I, you know, I just came up with it on my own. But like, I probably <laughs> had exposure to these things without realizing it. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's related to stoicism. I think of it more like radical responsibility. Um, there's a Hal Elrod, the Miracle Morning um, author quote that I really like, where he says, the moment you take complete responsibility for everything in your life is the moment you can change anything in your life. And so I really like that. And I think of it more like more like just being responsible for how you respond, because, you know, we're all dealt whatever cards were dealt. And you know, some people are born in extreme poverty. Some people are born, you know, with a lot of wealth. Um, and, you know, that may not be fair, but it really doesn't matter what's fair when you're looking at the perspective of what, what am I going to do about the situation I'm in, right? Like we can try to address poverty uh, as individuals and we should, we should try to help people out of poverty. But at the same time, like if you are born poor, like you could spend all of your time complaining about how other people have more money than you, or you can figure out how to get more money, right? Um, and it's not that simple but it, it is that simple in a way and it's like you can't control what stuff happens to you um another way to look at it is too like um tony robbins talks about um the reticular activating system um and other people call it like the bader meinhof effect it's like this idea that that your mind defaults to what's familiar with you. So if you like, if you get a new Honda Civic, all of a sudden it seems like everyone has a Honda Civic, same concept, right? I feel like that's kind of how this stuff works in my mind. It's like, I've gotten to the point where I'm always looking for the solution. And so my mind looks for solutions, right? I'm always thinking today's a good day. And so when bad stuff happens, I go, oh, that wasn't so bad. And when good stuff happens, I'm like, see, I got an extra chocolate chip in my cookie <laughs> you know it doesn't really matter what it is like that chocolate chip might be more important to me in that moment than the fact that you know i just broke my leg uh or whatever <laughs> i love it i love it uh hal alrod awesome stuff so uh so one of the other things that you founded of course is your old-fashioned real estate podcast so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you do on your podcast and and how it differs from others yeah. So, I mean, we, we do guests once in a while. I mean, we 
all, all, right before we came on here, we were talking about one of my guests, um, who's a um, a bigger pockets uh, frequent appearer, uh, Ben Labovich, who's a really great guy. If you guys get to know him, you should. Um, he's a multifamily syndicator out of Arizona, but normally what we do on our show is we just get drunk and talk about real estate. So we don't actually interview guests. It's just myself. And then get this, my, my co-host's name, he's got the best name in all of real estate, actually, um, Brian Leverage. So like Brian and I, Leverage, it's literally his last name. Um, we uh, partner together on real estate investing. Um, we do raise money occasionally for our deals as well. Uh, and we, we do some flips and stuff together. So we've been doing that for a while. Um, we one day were like, drinking at a bar because this is where all my good ideas come from uh we were sitting at the bar drinking an old-fashioned and we're like you know we should start a podcast like but but it needs to be different than everyone else's and i was like you know we like to sit around and talk about real estate while drinking so that's what we should do and that's what we do i love it and you did mention to me off camera before we get started that you've actually got some glasses on your website too i do yeah we sell old-fashioned glasses with the old-fashioned real estate logo on them so but like i said uh we only make like seven cents on them or eight I, it's very small it, it's less than a dollar i know that so i don't actually care if people buy them but they're so awesome that i wanted them for myself and the only way i could get them made is if i made like 140 of them so i was like well if i'm gonna have to make 12 dozen i'm gonna have to sell some of them <laughs> so, so so buy them in bulk that's the last that's one. right yeah well actually we're we've sold them fair amount i might have to reorder but i like them so much i don't even care like it's you know they're, they're like seven dollar glasses so it's it's okay i mean it, it, i'm gonna survive if i never sold any of them but i don't really need 150 of them so you know we we, we can go with uh we can go with selling a few here and there we give a lot of them away too like we have guests on our show we usually send them a care package or something because we have them and, and we have other stuff on there too you know t-shirts and whatnot but it's all the stuff that i wanted kind of like this hat i'm wearing it's the last hat ever. It's a last life ever uh, play that we made just because I wanted it. So awesome. Awesome. And yeah, I love branding. I mean, like I was telling you, I got some horizon multifamily brands that I use for my, I also have a great love for whiskey, usually straight, but the mm. old fashioned is got to be. Uh, well, it's the, the closest. Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, I mean, those are the closest cocktails to a straight whiskey, right? Like, exactly. This is a straight. I actually do drink a lot of like bourbon, just like on a rock, like we were talking about, like the big right. blocks. Though, I can't, I can't do like regular ice cubes because it waters it down too much. So I got to do right. the big block of ice. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Going out with the wife this evening, I'll be surprised if there's not at least a, a bur uh, Manhattan or old fashioned to be consumed. Yeah. And they're both so easy to make at home that like, I actually do, I don't make other cocktails at home ever, but every once in a while it's like, yeah, it's three ingredients. I can make an old fashioned. So yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. So then uh, maybe we pivot back to the multifamily. I know a lot of people on this show are interested particularly in real estate entrepreneurship, specifically multifamily. So then uh, you got into this in 2017. So you yeah. got larger and larger. Uh, tell us about your markets and your acquisitions criteria. Yeah, so um, we do value add for the most part. So we're looking at. Um, so I, first of all, I'm in. I'm in. I invest in Chattanooga where I live, and I invest in Michigan where I'm from. Um, no special sauce there. It's really. I had good networking and connections in both places. Um, I had people that I trusted for property management and stuff in both places. And to me, a lot of real estate investing is um, leveraging knowledge that you already have. Um, you know, people always say that there's like this, there's risk reward relationship where like riskier deals give a higher return. And that's certainly true. But the way you can mitigate risk without sacrificing return is to apply effort. And that effort can come in the form of like actually swinging hammers yourself, right? Uh, because you're going to see things with your own eyes or um, through superior market knowledge. So I'm a big believer in investing where you know, because that's one thing that you can you you can basically leverage stuff you already know. It's like everyone had Brandon Turner on the Bigger Pockets podcast used to always say, leverage your unfair advantage. Um, you know, if you have a rich uncle, you should like get money from your rich uncle and invest it in real estate. If you don't have a rich uncle, like, you know, figure out what your unfair advantage is and take advantage of it. And for me, like, 
to a large degree, those markets were my unfair advantage. I had I had good networking there. I had good knowledge of the market. Um, and so that's why I invest there. Um, and they both worked out really well. Chattanooga is actually a fantastic market, um, you know, with, with job and income growth for, you know, even through the Great Recession, uh, continued job and income growth in Chattanooga. Um, there was some market correction in prices, but, but I mean, the rents have continued to climb the whole time. So, so it's been really good here. Uh, anyway, so I do that and we tend to try to target stuff that's bigger than what mom and pop people would have. So like if people are out there buying duplexes, we're not trying to compete with them. Uh, we let them fight over duplexes. But if it turns out around a million dollar loan balance, people start getting scared off. And it's still too small for the big boys, right? Like the, the syndicators, the, the nationwide uh, firms, they're just not buying like one, two, three million dollar properties. So we just target that. Like we find one million, two million, three million dollar properties that are too small for the big national firms and too big for the local folks. And and there's less competition. I mean, in Chattanooga, there's maybe three or four people total buying the kind of stuff we buy. And that gives us a huge advantage. Uh, yeah. Would one of them be maybe Jake and Gino? Yeah, they, you know, they actually buy a little bit bigger stuff and they buy out of Knoxville. So if they buy the smaller stuff, it's up there. Like that, that's their market. So they're an hour away from here, maybe an hour and a half away. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've seen some of their students have picked up a building here or there. I mean, there are people like, you know, I say there's two or three people that do it regularly, but there are like, you know, we'll get a California investor, we'll buy a 20 unit building here or something. And, um, you know, you're always going to have some, some carryover from other markets and stuff. So. I love it. And uh, speaking of Tennessee, that is currently the number one market in terms of population inflow. I myself am in Central Florida. I'm enjoying the inflow to Central Florida, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like Tennessee right now. Yeah, no, I, I um, the the first we started hearing about that was the U-Haul reports, the the net migration of of U-Haul trucks. Like they're constantly like giving away. Like if you want to rent a truck in Chattanooga and drive it somewhere, it's like basically free because they want you to move it. So like it's like super cheap. But if you want to buy like rent a truck in Michigan and and drive to Chattanooga, it's like you know, 10 times as much money. I mean, it's literally that big of a difference because there's this net influx of trucks all the time with people moving here. Um, Central Florida is another market that's very interesting to me, actually. So um, I would say if you're, especially if you have good deep knowledge there, there's a lot of positives in that market as well. So I love it. I love your story about the uh, the move trucks, uh, the U-Hauls, because it's a lot like what's going on in the docks right now. You have all those uh, containers coming to America, and it's been the way for a long time, but now they just can't uh, put them back, right? Those yeah. containers are just piling up because you don't have enough dock workers, and they can hardly unload what's coming into the country now that people are buying some some goods as opposed to services. Yeah, no, and and then of course we're net importers of of goods, right? Mm -hmm. um, slight net exporter of services still, but net importer of goods. So um, you uh, already have like ships leaving like empty, right? And going to re reload rather than like, it's not like, you know, in the, in the olden days, people would trade and they'd bring spices and then they'd like leave uh, with like, you know, buckets of gold or something. So they at least had something to bring back. But now that all happens electronically. So, um, so you just have these like weird, like empty vessels leaving with like containers stacked up. Yeah. Huge, uh, huge differences in what's being traded now, big difference between the uh, the front hall and the back hall, as they say. But then getting back to uh, to real estate. So then, so, okay, so you're in, you're in Chattanooga and Michigan, two, uh, two great places. Now, Michigan, uh, maybe a little harder to make things work. You don't have uh, that sort of great influx of migration, but maybe some higher cap rates. So does that play into uh, maybe the, some of the strategies in those two states? Yeah, so we invest in in Michigan. Our our target market is workforce housing, um, and a lot of subsidized housing, right? So we're doing a lot of Section Eight stuff, um, and it's all about really having solid relationships with the local housing authorities, um, and also getting involved with um, veterans organizations, things like that. Because if you can get subsidized tenants 
and you provide them good, solid, clean, functional properties, um, you end up with a wait list because the, they're, those, those subsidies are generally paying market rent and, um, and, and, they, and they, those people can pick where they want to live. And since they're not paying the rent, um, they, uh, they, they pick whatever place is nicer. So you can, you can outcompete by providing better amenities, better services um, for, for uh, you know, the area that they want to live in. And so that's it. I mean, we, we buy in Metro Detroit, not in the city limits, mostly Macomb County. Um, and again, still targeting that um, one to four million dollar range and there's actually a lot more competition in properties there uh because there's a lot more properties uh though that offsets the competition so it's it's still worked out very very well for us um but that's more of a cash flow play um versus an equity play the stuff in chattanooga um we're usually able to buy stuff a little bit on the distress side fix it up raise the rents and then refinance it and pull our cash flow our cash out as a refinance instead of a cash flow play now on the Michigan side, uh, since it is more of a cash flow play, is it harder to get investors, or maybe you just have a different set of investors that are looking for that sort of cash flow? Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't really know because we've never raised money for our Michigan stuff. It's just been our own. That's where I started investing. Uh, my first. 50 properties were all in Michigan. And then um, my first multifamily that was in Chattanooga. And then we followed it up with a couple in Michigan right after that. We have, um, I'm about evenly split between the two. I have about 150 units in, in, in uh, Michigan and, and a similar amount down here now. Um, and, and, you know, the stuff up in Michigan, it's all, uh, there's just a couple of guys and we own it together. You know, maybe we own a third each uh, or a quarter each, depending on the deal. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's how we've done that. Uh, and we, most of that stuff was, we were flipping houses. We took the money from flipping houses to buy other houses. And then when the market started up ticking, we sold the houses in, in, in packages and then 1031 into buying apartments. I love it. 1031 into a car. It's like the, um, you know, three, four greenhouses to a red hotel strategy from Kiyosaki, but it was, uh, you know, seven greenhouses to a uh, red apartment building, you know, something like that. I love it. That's beautiful. And then you mentioned section eight. So that's fascinating to me. I understand that if you really know the inner workings of section eight, Obviously, you can do uh, very well, hopefully doing a lot of good along the way. Uh, a lot of people shy away from these Section 8s, but I know that uh, one of the other strategies I've seen is making more bedrooms, because my understanding is if you if you have more bedrooms, then essentially that's what Section 8 sets the cap on. So are you, are you doing that? In your yeah, apartments? so we haven't done that strategy in apartments. Some people do that in single family houses. It's actually a really... I mean, a lot of people do do that. And we have occasionally mo modified a floor plan of a single family. Um, and, and, and actually, we added a bedroom to a uh, multifamily property down here for a couple of units uh, that's not Section 8 because, you know, the market was like, hey, if we could have three bedrooms, we're going to get better rent. Um, and so we did it. Um, but the thing is, like with Section 8, um, it depends on the local market as to how they calculate the rents. So some areas, it's absolutely true. Well, all areas, they give you a higher voucher for more bedrooms. I mean, that's true. But some, the difference is greater. There's a greater differential between the two. And uh, for us, um, because we're in these multifamily uh, structures where um, market rents are determining the voucher level, uh, what we find is if we get a couple of tenants in our building paying a pretty good rent, then we can usually get all of the other rents up to that match that level. So we, we really focus on, um, you know, trying to get the best market rent for the building as possible because the closest comp for, you know, our Section 8 tenant is going to be another identical apartment in the same building. So if we can get good market rents, we can get good Section 8 rents. And so we try to balance, you know, like one third market tenants and two thirds subsidized tenants. Awesome. And then I know that most people or many people make the mistake of looking at Section 8 like it's monolithic, but really that's just an umbrella term for any sort of government subsidy for rent. So maybe you could help us understand some of the uh, the most important programs or maybe some of the programs yeah. that you found useful. 
So, so actually, you know, my um, partner would be better at, at answering this question than me um, because he's more operational in the Michigan stuff and that we don't do any subsidized housing uh, or very, very little of it in Chattanooga because the housing authority here has um, very strict limitations on, on raising rents. Uh, and so you can, in a rising rent environment here, you end up with subsidies that are below market rent. And I, I can't justify below market rents. I'm perfectly fine with slightly below or at market rents. But when you're like, um, we have one building where we're able to rent um, and there's still some care, you know, still some tenants in it from the previous owner that are on subsidy. They're getting like 550 for, for rent on the subsidized units. And we're getting like, um, you know, like 800 on the, on the non-subsidized. And the, the problem here is they limit us to 5% annual increases. So you'll never catch up with the rent. Like it's literally impossible. Um, the, and that's of course, I think a bad policy on their part because it forces us to, non-renew people and put new tenants in that are market rate tenants. Um, and so it actually limits the supply for the, for the, the subsidized tenants. And that, that's unfortunate, but I, I have investors in that deal and I have no choice, but to, you know, I have a, I have a, a you know, I have a fiduciary duty to the investor, so we have to do it. Um, but the stuff in Michigan, it's not like that. I mean, if we have higher rents in the building, we can literally just show them that we do a market study and say, this is what the rent should be. And they'll raise it. Um, and those are, so the, to answer your question a little bit more specifically though, the different se section eight is really just a, a section of the federal housing code, right? Like it's, 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 so it is kind of overarching. There are different programs inside of it. There are even homeowner programs where they'll subsidize mortgages under section eight. Um, and I have a friend here in Chattanooga that is working on single family houses where he brings in section eight tenants and then helps them reestablish their credit and then helps sell them the property that they're living in, um, utilizing subsidized mortgages. Uh, and he does that because he wants to basically move people from the streets, literally to homeowner status over their life cycle of their time with him. Um, and, and he would be a, a, a great person to ask about all the nuances of it because he studied this stuff. I'm just like, I have property managers and they tell me how it works and I go, okay, that sounds good. Great, and I love that statistic of being limited to 5%. So that might be okay in other times, but look what's going on right now. I mean, we've got inflation, um, we've got uh, underbuilding, chronic underbuilding for years. Uh, I just like to ask, those are the two things that I would cite in explosive rent growth. Uh, what are you seeing in the economic spectrum that's supporting some rapid rent increases? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, there's, of course, there's the COVID effect too, which we, it's hard to evaluate because you've got some people that haven't been evicted because of COVID restrictions and rent and eviction moratoriums and things like that. And then you have um, this huge uptick in demand um, offset a little bit by a lower uh, level of immigration during the year of COVID because the borders were closed. Um, but it's it, but but every all construction activity halted, you know, people and, and then lumber prices and stuff went through the roof, right? Which has slowed the new construction even further. And people are still looking at it and going, I'm not sure this is sustainable. So new building starts for multifamily are still way down in most markets. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're going to see rent growth for, for, for a very long time, because you also have a huge millennial generation, and then a Gen uh, Z behind that, right? Um, both of those generations are larger than any other existing generation, right? The baby boom was a little bigger than Gen Z, but the millennials actually had a net number higher than even the baby boom. Um, now, granted, as a percentage of population, it was less, but you have baby boomers now um, getting into retirement and saying, you know what, housing prices are way up. I would like to sell my house and go rent somewhere and use that as my retirement savings. Um, I have a um, friend, Harry Dent, who's a, you know, economic forecaster uh, and best-selling author. And he always says, and he's a baby boomer himself. And he says, look, we just got really dumb lucky. Like we didn't save any money. Um, our houses went way up in value and now we're getting ready to retire. We can sell our houses and live on that money and, um, and like rent someplace. So you have baby boomers moving into rent and you have 
millennials and Gen Zers as a bigger generation than the pre than than my generation, the Gen Xers, and they're all renting longer than 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 we did, frankly. So you've got this uptick in renters. Uh, that's that's very dramatic. And then when you couple that with increased immigration in the last year, in the last few months, uh, I just, I have a hard time. I really have a hard time seeing where um, where rental demand is going to not continue to skyrocket over the near future. Too true. And then when you add to that, uh, the fact that interest rates are literally at all time lows people have more money. They can, uh, you know, they look at that price and it doesn't look, few people are buying by cash, right? And oh, yeah. so without, you know, without a significant uh, cash buying. Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? Most people like, they, they, oh, it's 300,000, it's 400,000 per house, whatever it is, right? 200,000, that number is important, but that number is bigger than what most people can intellectualize. So what yeah. they say is, how much do I have to put down? Right. And it's usually not very much, you know, if they're buying for themselves, three percent, three and a half percent, five percent, you know, something like that. And then the second one is, what's my payment going to be? Well, if interest rates are, you know, sub three percent, um, an extra fifty thousand dollars in purchase price doesn't make that much difference. It's a very small difference in the, in the monthly payment. Exactly. That's my experience from the mortgage industry. It's all people care about. What's my new payment? hundred percent. And then another uh Quick personal story. I'm also in buildings. So talking about lumber and how that's impacted things. It was just yesterday, uh, July 13th, that lumber prices returned, I believe, to where they started the year of 2021. So it's ah. just pretty amazing. I think it spiked up to, uh, I can't even tell you, but like 5x from what it's been historically. Just amazing. Just absolutely yeah, and I mean amazing. Lumber futures are going down faster than actual lumber. And that's because it takes a, the supply chain is still broken, as we were talking about earlier with, you know, some container ships stacking up and not getting unloaded. And <laughs> when, you know, you know this, if you've been to a restaurant in the last uh, six weeks in the United States, and I've traveled a fair amount around the U.S. in the last little bit here. And uh, if you've been to a restaurant, you know that they can't find staffing. Well, it's the same problem at the ports. It's the same problem at the gas stations. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's the same problem with truck drivers. Um, and when you start breaking the supply chain like that, um, because demand's far outstripping the availability of labor, uh, it, it, you know, until the labor market starts paying a lot more, and and then that counteracts the the, the supply grows as a result of that. Um, you're just, it's just a long term problem, and I think we're going to continue to experience it. I don't, I don't see a near end to it. I re I really don't. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to wait till the market cracks and then I'm going to buy. Right. Uh, I just. I've known people that said that since 2013. And I'll tell you right now, um, I always tell people buy whenever, just buy whenever you buy, but just sell when it's high. Uh, and it's hard to know when it's high, right? But you won't lose money if you make a profit. So I always say, you know, just buy whenever. And like, you know, if it goes down, just wait it out. Cause like, if you have a cash flowing asset, um, it's hard to see how you lose it, right? I mean, if you have long term debt in place, you have cash flow, uh, you just keep paying the mortgage and eventually it's either paid off or uh, the price goes up high enough you can sell it at a profit. Yeah, and that reminds me of an anecdote. I've got a colleague who said, you know, hey, I'm not going to buy any stocks in 2016. You know, I think that the, the market's overheated. And, you know, hey, what, what about waiting for, say, a, t a 10 or 20 percent correction? Well, what is what's a 10 or 20 percent correction when in the meantime, uh, I just quickly took a look and we've more than doubled since yeah. 2016. So you can uh, you can lose a lot of money waiting for that 20 percent correction. Yeah, well, hopefully, um, you know, your friend was sitting on the sidelines long enough that when the covid crash came, he was able to look at that and go, sweet, I got a 40 percent correction. I can go in right now. The problem is people were petrified. Um, I bought in at the bottom. I went, this is dumb. This market is stupid. Like there's no way that that um, a business that's still operating went from being you know, worth $50 a share to $20 a share. I mean, Dow, Dow, Joe, Dow industrial, like the, the, not the industrial average, but like Dow chemical, the chemical company, like was $60 a share. And I bought it at 19. It's wow. $62. Now it makes me feel like a genius. But all I really said was, 
I don't see why demand for plastics and chemicals are going to go down like over the long term. So it's got to be okay. And you know what? It is. It's fine. And and I felt the same way about like Coca-Cola. I was like, I don't think the economy is going to get so bad that people are going to be afraid to drink Coca-Cola. So I bought Coca-Cola when it went down. Didn't go down as far as Dow did, unfortunately, but you know, it's back up to where it was before. Right. I love it. And uh, you know, a similar story. Uh, I once bought Pfizer right after the Biox issue. Right. And I'm thinking, you know, you got all these patents, you've got all these years and yeah. what is, do you lose a quarter of the company because uh, one patent is, is now essentially worthless? Per- yeah. perfect way to look at it yeah i mean and, and of course you know i mean theoretically that actually could if it was you know a quarter of their revenues or something i mean it wasn't in that case but i mean it is like it theoretically could but this COVID thing was like yes maybe the economy is never going to recover it's a possibility but if that i kind of took the if that happened then uh it doesn't matter what i do with my money it's not going to be useful anyway so like the way it was crashing i just kind of went like ah uh yeah i'm gonna just jump in and i actually wish i had bought more i bought a relatively small position and stuff and i knew at the time that i should have bought a lot of it of course if i could go back and do it all over again i would just buy bitcoin and call it good and not worry about any of it right (laughs) yeah i love the time machine comment because i bought a lot uh, when it was about 10 to 15 percent down during that COVID crisis. But what does that really mean when it goes down by 33? You're still better off. But then, uh, you know, hey, I got some real estate deals and ended up, you know, actually even losing money on the stuff I put in at 15 percent minus. So yeah. you can't. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing, like timing the market's really hard. And that's why I say this, like, especially with real estate, which is very forgiving, like stocks can go down and never come back up. And I mean, that can happen with some real estate sometimes, but honestly, like if you bought in 2006, top of the market, anywhere in the country, and you bought a selection of properties and you had to sell or refinance in 2009, 10 or 11, you got screwed you lost your butt, right? Mm -hmm. But if you could buy at 2006 prices now, you would jump all over them. So like if you could just buy cash flowing real estate with long-term financing and wait it out, all you had to do is wait until it went higher than what you paid for it. Yeah, I love it. And Mm -hmm. that's that's true going back to the 1900s. I've never analyzed it further back, but I looked at market cycles in real estate um, back to like 1890. Um, and about, you know, every 16 to 24 years, there's some kind of correction um, and it happens. And then, you know, uh, five years into the next cycle, you're up above where you were before. Yeah, too true. And I spent a lot of time at FRED, which is the St. Louis Fed database <laughs> of economics. I love that stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And when you look at the corrections in real estate, yeah, they happen. But uh, nationwide, I don't think you see much, uh, you know, above 10%. I mean, that's that's huge. Obviously, the Great Recession being a notable exception to that. But uh, you might lose more than that in a local real estate market. But if you're diversified, especially if you've got some passive investments, which I'm huge on, I, I love being an active investor, but I'm also a passive investor. There's really, uh, I, I don't want to say no way, but it's really, really hard to lose 10%, losing 50% in the stock market if you're forced to sell at the bottom, which, you know, hey, if that's what you're living off of, you will be, I guarantee. Uh, yeah, I mean, not- of course, in fairness, it is a little deceptive because of leverage, right? So if you have a 10% correction and, and you put 20% down, that's the same thing as losing 50% um, of your investment, right? Um, and so it's actually even possible. I mean, leverage cuts both ways, right? It supercharges your return, but it also supercharges your your potential losses. Um, but, you know, smart leverage, like I said, and, and cash flowing assets, it's you can wait those downturns out. It's hard to do that in the stock market, right? Because um, you can get into panics and you don't have any cash flow coming from it. So you see the money go down and it's just gone. And like, yeah, it might come back, but you've lost that opportunity forever. With real estate, as long as it's paying for itself, you get the benefit of the amortization gains in spite of the fact that the market went down and that offsets the downturn. Um, and so it's just fantastic. I mean, I love real estate for that reason. And uh, and even though I don't need to buy any more real estate, I could just sit back and like, you know, be on the beach drinking uh, 
bourbon uh, in Puerto Rico, although they drink a lot of rum and Coke there. Um, of course, Bacardi's made in Puerto Rico, so it's basically yes. the it's like practically free there. I think it's like seven dollars a fifth to buy Bacardi in uh, in Puerto Rico. So, so I, I think maybe I'd have to switch over to a rum and Coke drinker if I lived there. So, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So maybe we pivot just for the final section of the interview. So you've told us about that aha moment where you realized, hey, you know, real estate is the way to go. Don't want to work for the man. That was when you left the trucking company, took all those skills, went into real estate. How about uh, telling us as an entrepreneur, uh, who's been your greatest influence? Uh, you know, people have asked me that and it depends, right? It depends on what I'm thinking at the time. I, listen, my dad was always dabbling in small businesses. So probably my dad, right? He got me into law originally, even though that didn't work out. Um, he was a real estate investor. Um, when I was a kid, he had some rental properties. Um, never got into multifamily, but, but I mean, like, so getting me thinking about that stuff, that would be a really big influence. But as far as like famous people go, like people that people have heard of, um, you know, I've read a ton of real estate books and there's some very, very good ones, but the one that really like drove it home is the same one that everyone and their brother says. And that's the rich dad, poor dad, the, the whole series really of the first three or four books that Kiyosaki wrote. Um, it's, it's just really, I mean, it, it, it simplifies the concept and it gives you the, the idea to move forward. I love it. And then uh, how about some advice for young entrepreneurs or maybe advice that you might give your younger self? Yeah, just buy real estate, like buy real estate that pays for itself. If you do that, you're going to be fine in the long term and it starts sooner. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was right out of high school, when it first came out in like 97, 98, something like that. Didn't buy any real estate at all until 2011. I waited till I got sick and went bankrupt to be a real estate investor. I mean, I had my personal house. That's it. Um, that was a giant mistake. I knew the whole time that I wanted to invest in real estate. And I kept saying, someday I'll do it. Someday I'll do it. Someday I'll do it. But the truth is, you just got to do it. Like the sooner, the better, because over the long term, you're going to be happier to have started earlier. I love it. So I don't know if adventurous people are drawn to real estate or if it's just the case that real estate supports an adventurous lifestyle. But I got to say, Jeff, you are living the dream. And I want to thank you for coming on the Foundry today. Well, listen, I really appreciate it. I don't know the answer to that either, whether or not it's one way or the other. For me, I always was adventurous. I mean, before I got into real estate, I was traveling, I was exploring the world. Um, I still believe that it's much more important to live the best version of your life, um, you know, help people uh, build positiveness. But the easiest way to live the best version of your life is to buy back your time. And real estate is one really good way to do that, right? Like get your time so that you can do the things that you want to do. I love it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on.